Shalom. Nochmal guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Good morning, everybody. Boker Tov Lechulam. We are expecting some more people this morning. How <laughs> we still are. However, uh, we're going to be as punctlich as we can be by starting as of right now, with your permission. Uh, it's great to see all of you. This is almost the end of the conference, the last day of the GIF 20th um, anniversary celebration. Um, I hope you all gathered uh, lots of experience, not only from the scientific cooperation that we've all been talking about for the, for the last week or so, but from the country, especially those of you who visit Israel for the first time. Um, I understand that there was a very uh, uh, interesting evening last evening, last night, with the dinner gala, with uh, the different uh, greetings, and uh, with a very special atmosphere. I'm sorry I couldn't attend it. This morning, uh, our keynote speaker will be Professor Harald Zuhausen, as you all know. Um, we're going to be uh, presenting him later on. However, I have to regret right in the very beginning for, uh, in, on behalf of uh, Mr. Gidon Pat, the former minister, uh, who um, regrets for not being able to be with us this morning. Um, he apologizes, and uh, he was supposed to talk about, uh, he was, as you know, as you all know, one of the founders of GIF, and uh, he wanted to talk uh, about, in his eyes, how GIF became from dream to reality. That was the topic or the subject of his conversation. However, we have uh, greetings from, um, especially for GIF's 20th anniversary celebration, from Professor Dr. Heinz Riesenhuber, former Federal Minister of Research and Technology of Germany in the years 1982 to 1993. With your permission, I'm going to read his very warm and touching letter uh, to us. Dear uh, Dr. Barak, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> my heartiest congratulations on 20 successful years of GIF. Professor Riesenhuber goes on writing. I would have loved to participate in this extraordinary week of celebration to meet with old and dear colleagues to join in interesting conversations to follow the excellent speeches of outstanding scientists from our two countries. I regret very much uh, to have been held back by an engagement in the United States, which I could not postpone. I'm sending my uh, best uh, regards to all of you, and especially to Dr. Amnon Barak and to Gidon Pat, who have been great supporters of GIF from the very first beginning and who have helped to make GIF as successful as it is today. The idea for this uh, remarkable uh, joint foundation emerged in the mid-80s and was strongly promoted by Shimon Peres and Helmut Kohl. The idea behind was to establish a joint foundation for brilliant scientific cooperation projects. Uh, partners from both countries should work together in the uh, broad spectrum of natural sciences and in humanities, for thus foster excellence in science as well as close bonds between the scientific communities of our two countries. The funding capital should guarantee permanent security for planning. Together with my dear colleague, Gidon Pat, I was responsible for the building, the building up of this unique German-Israeli Foundation for Scientific Research and Development. Our Federal Minister of Finance, Gerhard Stoltenberg, uh, who had always been a great supporter of science and a great friend of Israel, went out of his way to provide the funds in this budget uh, for GIF, and in 1988 we could eventually nominate the members of our first Board of Governors. On the German side, these were Professor Ernst Bickert, Professor Hans Wiedenmüller, and Professor Hubert Mark, in latter then being a president 
of the German Research Foundation and Vice President of the Alexander von hum Humboldt Foundation. Um, to have the support of those highly respected scientists and our big research uh, organizations was highly important for a good start. The GIF and GIF has been uh, very successful ever since, right from the very beginning. Um, one could clearly see the large scale of scientific uh, teams supported by GIF starting out with the projects mainly concentrating on our fields of uh, life sciences and uh, agriculture. Some of the most impressive projects in later stages fostered new approaches in the treatment of cancer and Alzheimer as well as the creation of new materials by way of uh, nanotechnology or joint experiments in the Large Hadron Collider, I hope I pronounced it right, at the CERN in Geneva. Not to forget the humanities, the example, uh, for example, our joint excavations near Gat, that's in the south of Israel, to find uh, out more about this uh, ancient culture of the Philistines, the Palestinian culture. Until today, over 2,000 scientists from Israel and from Germany have worked uh, together in about 1,000 joint projects funded by GIF, and they have presented an impressive uh, variety of excellent papers. In addition, a special program for young scientists launched in year 2000 has supported over 200 promising scientific talents. The funding sums up a total of 165 million euro generated by GIF's uh, endow endowment capital currency of 211 million euro. For this brilliant performance, we, are great we, uh, we owe great respect and many thanks, especially to Dr. Amnon Barak, the best director GIF could ever wish to have and has led his foundation stead uh, steadily and with great commitment from its small beginning to the outstanding success we celebrate today. Thank you very much indeed, Amnon Barak. I would like to convey my best wishes to the future work of GIF to all of you who are present today, to all the scientific, all the scientists currently involved in projects supported by GIF, to all government uh, representatives uh, responsible for GIF, to the board, or the board of governors, and to the excellent staff of the foundation. May the future of GIF be as bright and inspiring as in the past. My best wishes to our two countries with kindest regards, Heinz Riesenhuber. Thank you very much. Are we going to... Uh, are we going to turn now to uh, Professor Zuhausen or are we going to start with Professor Doodle? Yeah, Professor Doodle, please. Um, we, th we take this, uh, this um, opportunity to invite uh, Professor Doodle to uh, share with us some of his experiences in the board, talking of which uh, we sum up the 20 years or the first 20 years of GIF. And uh, for being with us all these years, he uh, has a lot of experience and some points he would like to bring up. Professor Dudu. Good morning. I have uh, been selected uh, to replace uh, Professor Riesenhuber in his slot, but uh, this very nice letter has arrived. Actually, I have dressed with a bow uh, in order to re remind you of Professor Riesenhofer. And you can, you can, uh, and you can compare it on page seven and eight of the current uh, uh, Schiff booklet. Yeah. 
Well, I joined the board in 1990 uh, and uh, replaced uh, Dr. Robert Markel, who had become the president of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. I had gained experience in the funding of science in the respective bodies of the Forschungsgemeinschaft. The uh, board of governors consisted of three scientists from Israel and three uh, from Germany, all uh, from the exact sciences. And the board was chaired by the board sessions, which was chaired uh, by Dr. Amnon Barak. The board made suggestions and passed decisions concerning the policy of GIF and foremost uh, on the funding of joint research projects. The board find, uh, suggested the funding based on 12, up to 12 reviews by science, specialist scientists and by grading of uh, advisors for the different fields like uh, immunology or uh, nuclear physics. There were far more applications than could be funded and uh, the board uh, was all the time in trouble with the meager finances. Uh, in the beginning uh, of the granting periods, there were almost no applications from the humanities. The first one, I think, was uh, on this archaeology in, in God. And uh, the board uh, consisted almost of, only of physicists, chemists, uh, engineers, and uh, life uh, scientists. But we felt that the absence of the humanities was an essential narrowing of the aims of uh, GIF. Together with uh, Amnon Barak, we tried to institute symposia in Israel and, and Germany in the field uh, of uh, humanities and social sciences. And these uh, meetings uh, with invited uh, speakers from both countries enlarged the contacts and finally lowered the threshold uh, for applications. As I see by now, uh, humanities fare pretty well uh, within the uh, limits of GIF. Scientists in Israel enjoy quite heated discussions and they have no problem to fit in if necessary. Uh, in contrast, the atmosphere in the board meetings was very relaxed. Problems were argued very thoroughly, but finally practically all decisions were unanimous. I don't recall any group fights between Israeli and German governors. A common grievance all the time were the available funds in relation to the wealth of excellent projects uh, that would have been worth funding and a bad conscience about the extensive reviewing of all these uh, applications and the relatively meager outcome. Well, I wish Schiff further very good uh, function in the help of Israel and German science. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier, our keynote speaker, so to speak, this morning is Professor Zuhausen. As you probably, not probably, as you all know, he specifies in one of the most devastating diseases in our lifetime and probably throughout the history, the cancer of all kinds. He is one of the outstanding and leading scientists 
and researchers in the research of uh, cancer. And he is very well appreciated around the world. He received a number of national and international awards, among them the Robert Koch Prize, the, General, the Charles Mott Prize of the General Motors Cancer Research Foundation. General Motors? That's how they ran out of money. <laughs> the Federation of the European Cancer Scientists Clinical Research Award, the Paul Ehrlich Ludwig Darmstädter Prize, uh, the Jung Prize Hamburg, the Charles Rudolf Brupp Bacher Prize Zürich, the Arthur Burkhardt Prize Stuttgart. He received honorary doctors from the universities of Chicago, USA, Umea, Sweden, Prague, Czech Republic, uh, Salford, UK, and Helsinki, Finland. But most and above all, he is the 2008 Nobel Laureate in Medicine, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it is my honor to call upon to the stage Professor Harald Zuhausen. Thank you so much for your very kind introduction. You did, you did, absolutely right. Thank you very much. So, distinguished uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's for me a great pleasure and an honor to be here today at the celebration of the 20th anniversary of GIF, and I convey certainly my warmest congratulations to the organization. Uh, in fact, I have been only for a brief period, for three years, involved in the Board of Governors of GIF, but I had some experience with another type of uh, Israeli-German interaction, and that for even for a longer time, even for a longer time than GIF existence, namely the cooperation between the uh, Ministry of Science and Technology here and the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg. I think that cooperation, if I understood it yesterday correctly from Dr. Bauer, originated from a dilemma, from a dilemma of the German Ministry of Science who wanted to support cooperative projects between Israel and Germany in the medical field. But I think there was a veto from the finance ministry because they thought that health-related projects were not the task of the Ministry of Science and Technology. And uh, so to get out of this dilemma, they finally decided to provide this money to the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg and to leave it at their, uh, first at their uh, distribution. Now, in a way, this turned out to be an extremely successful, at least from my viewpoint, an extremely successful cooperative program, which is now going on for I calculated it 33 years by now, since 1975. And uh, in, within this pro program, a large number of projects have been covered during this period of time. There were a large number of joint publications, more than 300 joint publications coming out between Israeli and, and German groups. It was a twinning program. In each case, the support was given for joint projects between the two groups. And uh, in the meantime, over a period of these more than 30 years, uh, more than 20 million euros have been spent on this project, and each year three new projects are being covered. So it's a cooperation which really led to a, a substantial interaction between scientists in now here specifically, more or less, in Heidelberg and uh, in uh, Israel which worked out extremely well. I must say, I loved yesterday the remarks of Professor Shikinova when he stated that there is really an internationality of, of science, which is clearly uh, visible in these types of joint projects. Of course, neither GIF nor the, this program which I mentioned right now are the only pro programs which are presently going on in, in the cooperation between the two countries. But it's really marvelous to see that this is indeed flourishing. And uh, I hope, as Dr. Riesenhuber puts it in, 
it should be inspiring for the future as well. So we are all grateful that this was possible. We are also grateful to the respective ministries who uh, rendered it possible. So what I'm planning to do today is to provide you with a brief overlook of some of the work which we conducted over the years. I will dwell a little bit on some historical aspects and uh, also discuss at the end some of the now developing prospects of uh, cancer prevention, of a new prospect of vaccination against a specific type of uh, human cancer. Um, before doing so, let me just stress that is, at this moment we know approximately 21% of the global cancer incidence is being linked to infections. And there are just five infections which play a major role, and they are listed here on the slide. Could we dim a little bit the light? Maybe, I don't know. Can I do it here? Or oh, it should be all right. Um, this shows the gender differences which exist presently among these 20 percent or so of uh, cancers linked to infections. And as you can readily see, there's a there's a remarkable difference between uh, females and males in the incidence of infection-linked cancers. In females, the papilloma viruses, here labeled as HPV, play a major role because they are the cause of cervical cancer, as we know, whereas in males, the same types of agents play only a minor role. In contrast, another agent, namely a bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, which causes a substantial part of gastric cancers is a major player there. Hepatitis B and C viruses play also a significant role in both uh, genders and also in addition uh, there are some cases linked to Epstein-Barr virus which is here abbreviated as EBV. Now let me come immediately to the papilloma viruses which are also in some instances caused, called uh, human wart viruses. A little bit um, back look into the history, the infectious nature of warts was uh, recorded in 1907 by an Italian physician, Ciuffo, in, in Rome. He auto-inoculated wart material, cell-free wart material, into his skin and developed warts himself. And the typical particles, which are shown uh, somewhere there, there's no pointer available or something. Is that a pointer? I don't see that. It's, uh, you can see them there. Uh, they were discovered in 1949 by Strauss and colleagues in Houston. And uh, up to 1975, it has been commonly suspected there exists only one single wart virus, which causes the different forms of warts he listed here on the slide. But this turned out to be a wrong conclusion. And between 75 and uh, 1977, Two groups, ours as well as a group in Paris by Girard, were able to demonstrate that the group is extremely heterogeneous and we know at present 114 different, we call them genotypes, of uh, papilloma viruses. This shows a kind of a, a relative relatedness of individual types, which you can't, of course, reach from the distance. Uh, and this it shows an enormous heterogeneity of this group which stresses the fact that also the pathogenicity of individual types differs enormously within the same type of group. Now, what about cervical cancer? Cervical cancer has been very early suspected to have a rather remarkably specific origin, namely it depended apparently on sexual contacts. And this was already noted in, 19, in 1842 by an Italian physician in Verona in Italy uh, who noted that it was clearly linked to sexual contacts by studying the mortality statistics in Verona, noting that prostitutes and people who had a number of marriages um, were at a much higher risk and it was virtually absent in nuns. And between 1920 and 1960, a number of studies uh, have been conducted in order to analyze known sexually transmitted agents, in particular syphilis and gonorrhea, in their relationship to cervical cancer, and yet uh, they did not lead to reproducible results. In the end of the 1960s, 
the first virus was incriminated as a possible, possible agent, a possible causative agent, namely herpes simplex type 2. And this was based on the uh, observations that patients with cervical cancer had elevated antibodies to, in some cases at least, to this type of virus infection. And it was thought that it might be responsible. In fact, that went on and a number of reports came up up to the 1980s, which seemed to confirm this notion. Well, we started in 1969-70 to work on this subject here and failed to find the genetic material of herpes simplex virus type 2 in cervical cancer cells, since we previously were able to demonstrate another tumor virus, Epstein-Barr virus, in Burkitt's lymphoma and in nasopharyngeal carcinoma cells. We felt that we had a good technique available to show this, but this failure indeed uh, seemed to indicate that herpes simplex virus is not the right virus to look for in, as an etiological agent for cervical cancer. And since there existed a larger number of reports in the literature of anecdotal reports on the malignant conversion of genital warts, the so-called condylomata acuminata, uh, it uh, was not too far-fetched to suspect that possibly this virus or these viruses may play a role in uh, cervical cancer. So we initiated a program, and between 1974 and 77, I published the hypothesis that these viruses may be the causative agent of cervical cancer. And the initial, observ the initial studies which we conducted were related to foot warts, because from these types of lesions, it's possible to isolate large quantities of these viruses which cannot be grown in tissue culture or they cannot be transmitted to experimental animals because they are very host-specific. They infect only humans. And uh, by isolating the DNA of those viruses, we did a number of studies to see whether, first of all, we could find the same DNA, the same genetic material of these viruses, in genital warts and in cervical cancer. And it was already from the very first result quite clear that the viruses in genital warts must be different from those here in, in foot warts. And even the number of common warts showed no hybridization, as this test is called, uh, under those conditions which indicated the plurality of the papilloma virus types. Well, subsequently, between 1980 and 1982, our group was able to clone and to characterize the viruses which are present in genital warts by these, mainly these two people, Lutz Giesmann and Essel Michel de Villiers, who were working and cloned this, this DNA and characterized it what is now labeled as HPV, human papillomavirus type 6. And another agent was isolated from a laryngeal papillomatosis which is now labeled HPV-11. They are closely related. But in, in the early days, it was a disappointment because we couldn't find these viruses or the genetic material of these viruses in cervical cancer cells. Yet there were some indications that we were probably on the right track. I apologize for these ugly pictures, but indeed they, they are important because it was possible to demonstrate in these uh, very uh, huge types of tumors which or develop or which uh, very rarely, but which grow invasively to show that they contained HPV-6 or HPV-11 DNA in those cases. And in, even in one case of a cervical cancer, we eventually found the DNA of HPV-11. But with the aids of those types of probes, it became possible to demonstrate that in some of these cervical cancer cells there were some kind of faint bends under these types of conditions of uh, demonstration. And two of my students, Matthias Durst and Michael Bosart at that time, were able to, and they got the task to clone and to isolate these weak bends and to find then HPV-16 and HPV-18 and both of these viruses are clearly pre present in the vast majority of cervical cancers. HPV-16, as we know right now, in more than 50% of these cancers, and HPV-18 in something like 20% of those cancers. And indeed, uh, this turned out to be true throughout the world. We distributed the probes globally, and very quickly the results were confirmed, and very suddenly there was a, an enormously arising interest in papilloma virus research and their relation, the relationship of this virus group into human uh, cancers. 
uh, it was also possible here to demonstrate the same DNA in the precursor lesions of uh, various types of genital cancers as well. In the following years, uh, our group, and here in particular Elisabeth Schwarz, who is shown here, were able to demonstrate that the two genes only of the viral genome, the so-called E6 and E7 genes, are expressed in cervical cancer cells, whereas the other part of the genome is silent, and in addition that there is a specific pattern of integration uh, as far as the viral genome is concerned. There is a loss of part of the viral genome in the course of uh, malignant progression, and in addition, we could demonstrate relatively early that the viruses in these cells are, as we say, clonal, which means that already the first cell which arose as a cancer cell harbored the respective form of the integrated, or in some instances of non-integrated, uh, viral, viral DNA. So it was quite clear already quite early in the game that these viruses, at least from our viewpoint, must be causative agents in cervical cancer. And as a kind of footnote, I approached at this time the German companies and asked them for starting the production of a vaccine, which was a total failure, not a total failure in the beginning because one company became interested and even funded us for a while, but made a market analysis which told them that there's no market for this vaccine. And in addition, they also uh, claimed that they had done an antibody test, I don't know on which basis, and found something like 90% of the normal population already positive, so they felt there was no need for the vaccine, but this turned out to be also a false uh, result. But there are a number of subsequent developments, a number of additional agents were isolated by other groups as well as by ours um, in uh, collaboration with a group in Hamburg, we could demonstrate that oropharyngeal cancers to in part contain the same types of papilloma viruses as genital cancers do. It was possible to demonstrate that uh, the, these two genes which are expressed in cervical cancer are able to transform normal cells into a, not a malignant uh, but an intermediate state of continuous proliferation. There were studies conducted by Peter Howley. In fact, this links the papilloma virus research to well, whoever heard Dr. Shikinova talking yesterday with his work, because uh, here indeed, ubiquitination of uh, the P53 cellular protein uh, pines, pl uh, plays a major role in degrading and leading to dysfunction within these cells. This was work with what's mainly done in Peter Howley's group. There were other results, which I cannot summarize here right now, uh, which cl clearly showed that the virus is a causative agent of uh, cervical cancer. Now, uh, this shows, uh, once again, the typical virus particles, which contain this type of genetic material, circular molecules, which are schematically outlined here, coding for a number of genes. These are the two genes which I mentioned before, which code for the so-called oncoproteins, the tumor uh, proteins of these viruses. They're essential for the growth of malignant cells. And these are genes which we will discuss very briefly at the end because they are the ones which are important for the vaccination of papilloma viruses. We know now that there are a number of HPV types of papilloma virus types involved in cervical cancer yet the vast majority are due to these type, two types, 16 and 18, as I said, usually slightly more than 70% globally, and virtually almost all of these cervical cancers contain the uh, respective DNA of any of these types of viruses. It's a little bit different in valval and penile carcinomas, other any genital types of, of carcinomas, where only 30 to 50% are positive, for, again, for the same types of viruses, and at the same time, these, uh, we, we do not know the etiology of the remaining, what is it, 50 to 70 percent of these types of tumors. Vaginal carcinomas, anal and perianal cancers are also highly positive for the same types of viruses. And the not rare oral cavity and tonsillar cancer is also frequently positive. At least one third or something like one third of these tumors is positive. The rare nail bed cancer belongs into the same category. Cervical cancer is mainly a condition, a cancer occurring predominantly in the developing parts of the world. Central and South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia in particular, 
the data here from China are probably not correct because in rural areas in China the incidence of cervical cancer is very high, whereas in Shanghai and Beijing the incidence is very low due to screening procedures. In fact, it's an interesting aspect that the infections with these viruses, which are the causative agents of this type of cancer, do not differ very significantly. Let's say here, Central Europe, North America, and the high risk areas for cervical cancer. But the rate of cervical cancer is different, mainly due to the screening procedures which are applied within those countries with a relatively low incidence of this type of cancer. Oropharyngeal cancer, as I pointed out before, here the black areas or dark areas indicate, indicate areas with a higher risk of this cancer is not a rare cancer either, but cervical cancer is the second most frequent cancer in females globally. One can calculate, we did it for Germany, that approximately 1.1% of the infected female population eventually develops <coughs> cervical cancer. So the vast majority gets rid of this infection, mainly by immunological means. Uh, interestingly, the precancers, the uh, high-risk lesions, are relatively frequent. And we have, as it has been estimated recently, more than 120,000 conizations cutting out a piece of the, of the cervix of the uh, cervical canal uh, performed in Germany, a very high rate, which is, still has some complications as stated here, bleeding, obstruction of the cervical canal, subsequently in the rare cases also perforation of rectum or bladder and inflammation, and it has also some complications for subsequent pregnancies. And I learned to my own amazement that there are about 2,500 hysterectomies, removals of the uterus, performed annually for the very same reason, because these persons have high-risk lesions. So the precursor lesions are by no means not important. They are important and deserve attention. We know that more than half of the sexually active women and men acquire these types of infections at some point during their lives. As I said, the majority gets rid of it by immunological interference. There are estimates from the United States of the annual incidence, but clearly the vast majority of these infections occur at early age between 15 and 24 years, and they occur soon after the onset of sexual activity. Uh, the virus persists for quite a long time in the infected person, and we can calculate that the average duration is something like 8 to 10 months. During this period, the virus production goes on in the infected person, and everyone who has contact with this person is at risk to become infected as well. 30% of these women remain positive for more than one year, and about 10% still positive after two years. This is the proportion of women <coughs> excuse me, who are at risk for cervical cancer. It's an interesting question why these persons remain positive within this period of two years. There are a number of reasons, I will not dwell on them in spe specifically, but one which is important is that the genes of this virus itself, although expressed usually only at a low level, are mutagenic, they modify the DNA of the host cell. And let me stress from the beginning, there's no virus caused tumors without modifications of the host cell DNA, of the host cell genome. They're always occurring, some have to occur, some specific mutations in the host cell genome in order to permit, in many instances, the viral genomes to be expressed very highly and to contribute to the malignant uh, proliferation. <coughs> uh, well, I think I can skip this one. Uh, so we know right now, particularly from studying this system, that the oncogenesis by such viruses uh, requires genetic and, in addition, in some instances, epigenetic modifications in genes of at least three host cell signaling cascades which have to inactivate some specific functions inside the cell which develop during our own evolution in order to protect ourselves against the deleterious effect of these types of infections. They involve the immunological control, the immunolo immunological surveillance. There is an intracellular control existing of the viral oncoproteins and there's also a regulation which is mediated by macrophages as a paracrine uh, control of viral gene activity. So these two genes fulfill functions, they synergize very actively with each other, although each of them comprise, uh, represents by itself an important 
potential carcinogenic factor. We know that the period prior to between infection and invasive cancer is usually something in the order of 20 to 30, sometimes 15, 15 to 30 years. So it's a long period, and in other infections linked to cancer, it's even longer. And yet, the reason, of course, is that within this period of time, a number of changes have to occur within the infected cell, within the genome, the genetic material of the cells which acquired the persistent uh, genomes of the viruses in order to permit an uninhibited expression of the viral oncogenes. And the expression of these viral oncogenes is very high at this stage here, even in the high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, but it's very low here in the previous stages of uh, infection. Now, we do know that the viruses are causative and they are essential factors for the malignant proliferation because the E6 and E7 genes are present and uniformly active in cervical cancer cells. They possess themselves growth-promoting and uh, transforming activities. The malignant phenotype of cervical cancer cells depends on the expression. If you switch them off, which can unfortunately be done only experimentally under experimental conditions, the cells are no longer cancer cells. They lose their carcinogenic properties and revert to kind of a quasi-normal state. There are a number of other studies, epidemiological studies, which identify these viruses as the major risk factors for cervical cancer. And as it, I will dwell on this in a moment, the vaccines which have been developed protect against the essential precursor lesions of this type of cancer right now, which has been very well demonstrated. So this brings me, in fact, to the vaccination, a painting here which shows the original vaccination by Jenner, the pox virus vaccina vaccination performed in the end of the, 7th, of the 18th century. Uh, so since we know that immune mechanisms control most tumor virus infections, some of them should represent suitable targets for vaccination. And indeed, as we know today, the uh, vaccination becomes reality. I think it was quite interesting to look for a second into the history of vaccination because this study here was a very important one performed in 1995 where in a dog kennel, where a huge kennel breeding dogs for experimental purposes, each of the young puppies developed oral papillomatosis, a rather ugly papillomatosis of the oral cavity, and the, the kennel owners could not sell these dogs anymore, at least not during this period, although after a couple of months they disappeared spontaneously. And so, uh, in fact, we had a chance to um, purify and to, to analyze the virus of these dogs, and the, a group here in the States produced a vaccine against these uh, viruses and showed by inoculating 14,000 of these puppies that none of them developed subsequently oral papillomatosis, showing the, that indeed it is a very successful type of vaccination which was subsequently developed also then for humans and uh, basically by genetic engineering, by putting the gene which codes for the major structural component of the virus particle, the so-called L1 gene, into recombinant uh, systems in yeast or also in cellular systems, in uh, mamma mammalian cell systems or in, in insect cell systems here. And under those conditions, a protein is being formed and it forms capsomeres, which spontaneously aggregate subsequently into what is called virus-like particles, which can be relatively readily purified. They're empty shells of the virus without genetic material and are presently the basis for the vaccination. The results of the clinical studies, and they have been conducted in a large number by now, showed that these types of vaccines produce very high antibody titers, even without addition of adjuvants. They are commonly at least 10, usually something like 100 times higher, times higher than in natural types of infections with these viruses. The antibodies persist for prolonged periods of times and then no significant side effects have been observed in spite of some reports in the press of death cases occurring after vaccination. To my knowledge, none of them have been verified of being linked to the infection. The infection does not seem to be more risky than any kind of infection of vaccination. Excuse me, vaccination. It's not more risky than any kind of those vaccinations which we are presently applying to children. Um, 
the protective effect for previous non-exposed women comes to close to 100% in preventing the infection and in preventing precursor lesions. Of course, we don't know yet for sure that it also prevents cervical cancer because, as I said before, the latency period is something like 20 or even more years than 20 years, so we will have to wait for this. But on the other hand, since the essential precursor lesions are prevented, it's likely that the, the cancer, or it's even highly probable that cancer is as well prevented by this type of uh, vaccination in the future. It's important to know that this vaccine acts only as a preventive vaccine if a person becomes infected with these viruses because it neutralizes the virus particles, which are incoming, if an infection if has, has already occurred in a person, the vaccine is not active at all, as far as we know, because the cells no longer express the respective proteins which, uh, against which the antibodies are being developed. We know we have two vaccines presently available. One contains four types of these viruses, including the genital wart viruses. The other one contains two, and the antibody levels are relatively high now after observation periods now for six up to close to seven years. And it's likely one can interpolate this from data with the hepatitis B virus vaccine that it probably the protective effect will go on at least for 10 years and possibly even for longer that will have to be seen, which may then require one booster inoculation. The negative aspect of the vaccine is it's extremely expensive. It's in Germany, it's 465 euros, three shots. In the States, it's cheaper, but in some other countries, it's even more expensive than in our country. So uh, this is really something which needs to be changed because as a, the greatest demand is, of course, for the developing parts of the world, and for them, the present prices are unaffordable. Yet uh, there are intentions, first of all, by the industry, by the companies who produce it, but secondly, also within the industry, in, within the developing countries, uh, some companies are developing their own vaccines right now. So I presume that in a short period of time, the prices will uh, substantially decline. The dis some discussed uh, and open questions listed here, which age groups should be vaccinated? Only girls in some countries, it's between nine and 17 years. In Germany, we have it between 12 and 17 years. It depends a little bit on the uh, cultural habits within those countries. But clearly, the vaccination should be given prior to the onset of sexual activity. Otherwise, it's more or less worthless. And uh, so this age group is probably in a, in a good range. In some countries where no screening procedures exist, like sub-Saharan Africa, it would be recommendable, recommendable to uh, select very early age groups between, let's say, 9 and 11 or something like this. Should the vaccine only apply to persons who are negative in tests for papilloma viruses? The answer is difficult to provide because the negative result does not exclude a previous exposure of that person to the respective virus, but this is clearly an open question which needs to be better clarified in the future. But important is to ask whether boys and young adult males should be also vaccinated. In my opinion, um, I'm a strong supporter of this vaccination as well because there are several reasons genital warts, at least one of the vaccines protect against them, occur very frequently in males as well. The anal cancers and oral cancers linked to the same types of viruses occur in males even more frequently than in females. And clearly, there's also a matter of the gender solidarity of the protection of, of the uh, respective partners which I think is an important issue. There's an argument that if you vaccinate 60% of, of girls of a specific age group continuously, there would be herd immunity and it would interrupt the, the infection chain. Yet I feel that, uh, first of all, reaching 60% is not so easy. And secondly, it almost certainly does not do any harm and will even enhance the time period by which infection chains will be interrupted if we vaccinate boys as well. Does the vaccination lead to a prolongation of intervals for cervical cancer screening? An important question because, uh, as I mentioned before, the vaccines which are presently available protect only against 70, at most against 80 percent of cervical cancers. There's some cross reactivity with some other types which are found in cervical cancer, but it's clearly not more than 80 percent. And we have to exclude, of course, the 20 percent of other types which infect 
and which may lead to cervical lesions as well. Does the application result in a higher increased promiscuity of young girls, a question which was mainly discussed, at least to my knowledge, in the United States and in Canada. It's much less discussed in Europe. We had, of course, this discussion before with the introduction of the contraceptive pills. Now, there are other, at the moment, at this moment, there are other concepts available to facilitate the production of vaccines and also to reduce the costs of the vaccine production. One of them is to produce the vaccines in bacteria, in Escherichia coli. Under those conditions, only these types of structures are being formed, not the virus-like particles. They can be, again, easily purified. And in fact, the first vaccination of dogs was performed with this type of, of preparation. Uh, you need slightly higher protein concentrations in order to achieve the same results as with virus-like particles, but it works reasonably well. Uh, there are other concepts to insert the respective gene into vector systems, like a vector system which is here based on so-called adeno-associated viruses, where you insert the gene here, and under those circumstances, you can use these types of vaccines as an intranasal spray. One of our colleagues at our place, Jürgen Kleinschmidt, is working on it. And under those conditions, the cells of the nasal cavity become, in a way, infected and start to produce their own virus-like particles. The advantage here is that they are heat resistant. They tolerate easily 60 degrees centigrade, these types of particles, and so they do not need cold chains. And in addition, as I said before, they are quite promising candidates for intranasal uh, vaccination. In some of the tropical countries, the use of syringes is uh, highly risky in order, because they will be used repeatedly, the same syringes without proper sterilization and other diseases like AIDS and hepatitis C and others may be transmitted by this mode. There exist a number of other alternatives. I will not dwell on them in detail, but let me just point out that there is one interesting alternative. There is one protein in the virus particle which has a specific region which is shared by most of the different types of papilloma viruses, and so it provides a prospect, at least for group-specific vaccination, which also may protect against uh, common warts as well. So there are a number of groups working on different systems at the moment, and hopefully something else will, be, will come out in the future. This is my last slide here. In a way, the preventive vaccination against high-risk HPVs represents a good example of successful translational research. In fact, it's not the only anti-cancer vaccine which exists right now because hepatitis B virus vaccines initially developed to prevent the symptoms of the hepatitis B virus infection turned out in the end also to be protective against the development of hepatitis B linked liver cancer. So we have two vaccines at this moment which fulfill the purpose of being a kind of a specific, uh, specific vaccine against specific types of cancers. There are a number of questions which still remain open. How can we prevent all the remaining infections, the high-risk types, which we know today? Uh, can we produce polyvalent vaccines? And they, I, I think some of these preparations are well underway. Theoretically, it shouldn't be a problem. Is it possible to eradicate the major risk types, which theoretically would be feasible? We have about 500,000 cervical cancer cases annually and a very large number of precursor lesions, as I pointed it out before. So it is a global problem and an important problem. Is it possible to develop also a therapeutic type of vaccination? The data so far are a little bit disappointing, I should say, but maybe in the future it may change. And is it possible, since we know exactly the targets, how the virus acts and how the virus uh, leads to, to cancer development, which genes or gene products are responsible, it may be possible to develop a, a specific targeted chemotherapy to HPV, of HPV infections, which may lead to the treatment of persistent infections, early lesions, and also to HPV-linked cancers. So basically, the role of infectious agents in human cancers has been, in my opinion, highly underrated in the past, and it's only relatively recent that it's emerged as an important factor of uh, human cancer development, an important factor which, as I said in the beginning, covers something like 21 percent of the global cancer incidence, but there's some likelihood, at least from the viewpoint of those who are engaged in this field, 
that this percentage will increase in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Hall to Hausen. I take a lot of pride by saying uh, this opportunity that in two weeks from now, approximately, at December 10th, I'm going to be carrying live the Nobel Prize Award ceremony directly from Sweden, Stockholm, in our network, Israel Schnorren from Kanal 1. It is a pleasure. Thank you. And my congratulations to Professor Zuhausen. <laughs> Are you going to be talking at the ceremony in Stockholm? I don't know yet. <laughs> so who should we ask? The Queen? The King? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your kind uh, and interesting words. However, sometimes um, not very regular to, for those who are not members of the scientific community. Uh, we, ha we also take a lot of pride this morning by uh, sharing with us some of, uh, sharing with you some of the programs that GIF is responsible and uh, probably uh, Probably those programs were made possible with the support of GIF. This is a presentation of selected GIF-supported projects in the regular program by both principal investigators. So we're going to have both Israeli and German researchers, investigators, uh, scientists, making a short presentation of the research. We're going to have four groups of two. However, we're going to start with one uh, investigator who will be uh, telling us about his research in uh, photochemi uh, photochemotherapy for cancer treatment. I call upon to the research professor Avigdor Schertz from the Weizmann Institute. Professor Schertz, uh, let me begin by saying that Professor Hugo Scher from the University of München, who is your partner, could not be with us this morning, so you're going to be on your own. Well, not exactly. Uh, he is, he is here? Yeah, he's on the uh, film. Oh, 